Hi, my name is Chris Nolan. I'm a barrister at Queen Victoria Chambers in Sydney. This video is called Firearm Licence Appeals and it's designed to assist legal practitioners in the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal. So in the state of New South Wales, uh, firearm licences are issued by the Commissioner of Police. In order to get one, you firstly need to show that you have a legitimate reason to have one, which is usually that you are a prim primary producer and you need the firearm to destroy stock and shoot vermin, or that you are a sporting shooter. There's no point in saying that you want a firearm to defend yourself and your property. Uh, that is not a valid reason. So you fill in your application online and you state what is your legitimate reason to need a firearm. Uh, and you pay your fee and then they will get back to you and say either yes or no. And they will generally say no on the flimsiest of reasons. Uh, when that happens, you have a right to seek an internal review. And that means that a more senior person within the firearms registry will review the decision. And they can set it aside or they can affirm it. I think it is extremely rare to uh, succeed on internal review and a lot of time they don't even get back to you anyway. Do not wait uh, to, for that internal review to come back to you. Uh, they have 28 days to complete their internal review. If they don't respond within the 28 days, it becomes what's called a deemed refusal, which means you can go straight to the tribunal and seek a review. So the procedure when you get to the tribunal is you'll have a mention date and they will give a timetable for evidence and a hearing date. So the evidence is what's called a Section 58 bundle. And that means that uh, the, tribe, the Firearms Registry will prepare a bundle of all of the documents that they possess that are relative, relevant to your uh, application and they will serve that on you. In most of the cases I've done, there's also been an application under Section 59. And what that means is that the police have secret information that they want to put before the tribunal, but they don't want to show to the applicant. So you don't get to see it. And in my experience, that is a formality. They will make an application to the tribunal. The tribunal will list it for hearing. They will tell you it's happening, but you're not allowed to attend. The police will attend. They will show them their secret evidence. And invariably, the tribunal member will agree to admit that and put that before the tribunal member who is making the decision. But you don't get to see it and you don't get to make submissions on it. Is that information accurate? Well, we don't know. We just have to uh, assume that the police and the tribunal will always do the right thing. So what are the tests that the tribunal applies? Well, there are two of them in the Firearms Act. The first is a mandatory fit and proper person test found in section 11 of the Firearms Act. So what does the term fit and proper mean? Well, that matter has gone all the way to the High Court of Australia. And the leading case is called Australian Broadcasting Tribunal and Bond. In that case, the High Court found that the words fit and proper uh, have no meaning by themselves. They take their meaning from their context no one can claim to be generically fit and proper. You can only be fit and proper with respect to a particular occupation. So for example, I have a driver license, so I'm fit and proper to uh, drive a car, but uh, I don't have a pilot's license and that's probably the correct decision because I don't, I, I don't know how to fly a plane. I don't have the knowledge, the skills or the experience, so I would not be a fit and proper person to do that. But it's important to remember that just because they make a finding that you're not fit and proper, that doesn't mean they're alleging that you're stupid or that you are dishonest or that you're a danger to the public. Um, I have a colleague who, um, uh, quite late in life, he went blind. Um, because of that, he had a driver license, but when he went legally blind, obviously he was no longer a fit and proper person to have a driver's license. They took it away from him. That wasn't a punishment. They weren't saying he wasn't smart or that he was dishonest. They simply acknowledged that he would be a danger to himself and others if he had a driver license. And perform that occupation. The second test is a discretionary test called the public interest test that's found in section 7 of the Firearms Act and the test for that is are you an unacceptable risk uh, to the public if you had a firearms license. So no one can claim to be no risk to the public the test is are you an unacceptable risk and that usually turns on uh, some criminal offences that might have been committed in the past or it may be that uh, you have some associates who um, have done some questionable things in the past and uh, you're guilty by association. So you should be thinking to yourself right now that those tests sound uh, quite similar and indeed they are. There's a lot of overlap between them. If you fail one of the tests, you're very likely to fail the other. So the police will bring their section 58 bundle and you'll be able to respond to that. They're likely also to bring their section 59 material that you don't get to see. 
You then need to bring your own evidence to respond to the information that they've provided to you. And in general, that would be character evidence. So you would go to um, your friends and neighbours if you live on a farm and you'd say, um, you know, have you, and they'd write you letters to say that they've seen you using and storing firearms and you've always done so safely and you're a responsible person. Or if you're a sporting shooter, you'd go to your gun club and you'd get all the people at the range to write letters to say that you've been a member of the club for so many years, they've seen you, uh, witnessed you using firearms and you're always responsible uh, with, with the use and storage. And that's the evidence that you would use to show that you are a fit and proper person and that you are not a threat to an unacceptable risk to public safety. So now I'd like to tell you about a case that I ran in the tribunal called EMB, Echo Michael Bravo. Uh, EMB was a model gun owner. He, uh, his father had been in the army and trained him to use firearms when he was a child. When he was in high school, he was on the high school shooting team and competed in marksmanship competitions. When he left high school, he joined the army and uh, they trained him to use firearms. After he left the army, he lived on a country property and worked as a primary producer using firearms and he was a keen marksman. He would travel the world going to shooting competitions and he was, would coach younger guys to do that as well. So he owned a firearm for many decades without any incident. He always obeyed the law. He always used and stored his firearms safely. Now, the problem is that after two decades of owning a firearm, he was charged with historical sex crimes against children. And when you're charged with a serious offence like that, you're automatically disqualified. So he surrendered his firearms as required by law, and he always complied with the law. So he went to the district court, and there were two complainants. One of them gave her evidence, and after that, the DPP sought leave to withdraw the indictment against him, which meant uh, he walked out of court an innocent man. He walked in as an innocent man and he walked out with his innocence intact. However, he was not acquitted by the jury, which means that the DPP and the police could charge him again at any time. So any lawyer would tell him to uh, exercise his right to silence and make no comment about the allegation, whether in court or tribunal or, or outside. So having been, uh, once the charge was dismissed, he of course applied to get his firearms license back and the police said no. They said he wasn't a fit and proper person and he'd be an unacceptable risk to public safety. So I went to the tribunal and uh, ran his case for him. He brought his character references from his friends and family and from his uh, colleagues at the shooting club. Uh, the police brought their Section 58 bundle and uh, another Section 59 bundle of secret material and put that all before the tribunal and they they clearly thought it was a lay down misere that the tribunal would refuse to issue the license and they were very surprised when the tribunal um, set aside their decision and gave them uh, gave Mr. ABMB his firearms license and it was an interesting judgment for this reason the police put the entire prosecution brief of evidence before the tribunal and EMB couldn't respond to that he had to exercise his right to silence and what this means is that the tribunal made a finding of fact on the balance of probabilities that the offending had occurred and furthermore that it was abhorrent. However, the member went on to say that notwithstanding that, he was still a fit and proper person to have a firearms license and he was not an unacceptable risk to uh, the community. Now I've told that story to many people, both lawyers and laymen, and all of them are very surprised at that outcome. They all seem to, and the reason is that they're applying a different test to what's in the Firearms Act. Their reasoning seems to be He's a naughty boy, so we're going to take away his toys. Now, that might work with a child in primary school, but it doesn't work with adults, and it certainly is not the test in the Firearms Act. Uh, when we had our hearing, I submitted to the tribunal that there was absolutely no connection between the alleged offending, which they found had occurred, and owning a firearm. No firearm was, had been used in these alleged offences, so issuing a firearms licence to EMB would not increase the risk of reoffending, and refusing to issue a firearms license would not decrease the risk of reoffending. There was no nexus. And to drive the point home, I pointed out another submission that the police had made, which was that he had some traffic offences on his record from when he was a younger man, and they were all more than 10 years old. And I said to the tribunal member, look, if they believe he's a bad driver and he's a danger to himself and others, then they would take away his driver license they wouldn't take away his firearms license because there's absolutely no nexus between the driving offences and the firearms license. And 
you know, for some reason, they haven't attempted to take away his driver license. Uh, so they're being a bit disingenuous by trying to rely on those traffic offences. So EMB got up in the tribunal, they set aside the decision and uh, ordered that the police commissioner issue a license. Now the problem here is that the police commissioner then refused to do so. Um, he acted, well, 28 days went by and the police have a uh, 28 day period to lodge an appeal. After 27 days, they filed their appeal and they sought a stay. Now that stay application was heard uh, about six weeks after the uh, NCAD hearing and the stay was refused. So uh, a, a NCAD order comes into force on the day it's made. For that six week period, the police commissioner had been had, had been briefed of the tribunal's orders and that technically is a contempt of the tribunal. So what do you do when the police commissioner simply refuses to obey the law or accept a decision of the tribunal? Uh, the tribunal itself can't send people to prison. But what it can do is refer people to uh, the Supreme Court to be dealt with for contempt. And that's exactly what I did. On about the 20th of December, I put on an application to refer the police commissioner to the Supreme Court for uh, contempt of the tribunal. And in pretty short order, we received an email from the firearms registry saying that they would issue the license. So now we move on to the appeal. So EMB had his license issued to him, but we then had to go before the appeals panel. And unfortunately, the police commissioner got up in the appeals panel. The appeals panel found that the tribunal member had failed to give sufficient weight to the evidence, especially the evidence um, in the prosecution brief. And the matter was remitted back to the tribunal to be redetermined by the same tribunal member, um, having regard to the same evidence. Now, unsurprisingly to me, the same member looked at the same evidence and came to the same conclusion. She found that EMB was a fit and proper person to have a firearms license and that he was not an unacceptable risk to public safety. Now, the second time around, she went to great pains to list all of the evidence that had been put in front of her and all of the, and how much weight she was giving that evidence and all of the inferences she was making from that evidence. So the second time around, it was the same conclusion, but it was a much more detailed judgment explaining exactly how those two tests apply and exactly how she was using the evidence. Once again, the Commissioner of Police was dissatisfied with this decision and lodged an appeal. So that appeal was uh, dismissed and uh, EMB has had his firearms license and his firearms and he's been using them and storing them without incident ever since. So the moral of the story is if you have a matter, a firearms matter in the NCAT, don't get misled or misdirected into other areas. Look at the Firearms Act and address the two tests that are in it, which is the fit and proper person test and the public safety and the public interest test. Don't get distracted by other tests or other things which might not be relevant to your particular case. So thank you for your attention and please uh, watch my other videos and subscribe. Thank you.